What's going on, everybody? Welcome into a special edition of the Daily Energy Newsbeat stand-up here on this gorgeous Saturday, May 4th, 2024, um, for our special weekly recap. It's been a long week, folks. We did a bunch of solo shows. Stu and I are going to be back full-time together in the chair next week, so appreciate everybody hanging in. It was a busy, busy week, guys. I had an opportunity to ramp for a few shows. Lots of earnings calls, lots of interesting stuff going on on the LNG side, so I'm just going to go ahead and turn it over to the weekly recap and the team to queue us up right now. As always, guys, the news and analysis you're about to hear brought to you by the world's greatest website, www.energynewsbeat.com, the best place for all your energy and oil and gas news. Um, go ahead and uh, check out the description below, all the links to the articles, everything you'll need to know. Um, but with that, I'm going to turn it over to the weekly recap. We'll see you on Monday, folks. This story is, is amazing in the sense that Biden ad- administration finalizes power plant rule. This one, I've got several things for Miss Producer uh, to bring up as I talk about these things. There are five key takeaways. I have to uh, take a look at this. The, the EPA has finalized its power plant rule, which it, uh, forces existing coal and new natural gas, gas plants to use technology that is either ne- neither economic nor commercial to reduce carbon dioxide uh, uh, emissions uh, or to shutter. The EPA, number two, will define the requirements for existing natural gas plants later. The author of this story feels that it may most likely be after November election. Uh, this is to pacify the green movement. Don't kid yourself. Number three, since natural gas and coal supply about 60% of the U.S. electricity and backup intermittent weather-driven wind and solar units, the rule calls into question the survival and reliability of the electric grid. I kid you not, this is not good. If you're going to take out the coal plants in a very expedient manner, We cannot get the regulatory process um, done for nuclear fast enough. This is a a recipe for disaster. And the only thing that's going to solve it is rolling blackouts or using even less energy. Tell that to the AI and the data center folks. The number four, the rule is drawn by uh, uh, bipartisan criticism for its potential impact on the grid which groups are concerned with the importance of reliable and affordable electricity. The rule will increase electricity prices and decrease reliability and raise the potential for economic disruption in the United States. The author has all five of these key takeaways uh, wonderfully. Uh, The changes include uh, need to start capturing 90% of their carbon dioxide emissions by 2032 rather than 2030 as originally proposed. So what? They're still not going to be able to do it. Um, And and as carbon capture and sequestration technology is neither commercially available nor economic. We're already deindustrializing the United States, uh, just like Germany. And Germany is now, um, the EU is gone. And, and so when you sit back and take a look at the GDP growth for the EU and the economic, people are going hungry. This is a significant issue in uh, pacification of the, the left or the greenies that are out there. I'm all about, let's save the environment. Let's save uh, the planet. Let's not pollute, but let's have a discussion on this. Let's also go in and hear fossil fuel plants that are not retrofitted with carbon capture systems must exit the grid by January, 2039, instead of January, 2040 as originally proposed. This is even more of an issue uh, because it's just not going to be there. They're making it fiscally uh, unsound for com- uh, power plants to keep their power online and solar is not going to be there. Wind is not going to be there. 
facilities that broke ground after the proposal came out last year and will run frequently must capture 90% of their emissions or prevent that amount from emissions in some other way or close down. This is absolutely frightening. Uh, Miss Producer, if you could bring up uh, the first video, and let's take a look at this video. The video is CO2 methane and generated around the world. I want to bring this up just from a standpoint. As, as we kind of watch this video go around, we start, we're looking at Spain, and you're seeing that you can even see the this methane map and CO2 is picking up uh, uh, where the shipping and air, and you take a look at China. Holy smokes. That is where most of the population and pollution is happening right now is India and China. Miss Producer, can you go ahead and bring up the second video? The second video is a China coal power plant. And as I watch this, you take a look at the smog. This is one power plant. And we're going to go through some of these other numbers here in a sec. This is an eye-opener for me. There's an article that just came out yesterday, and it says that China is now putting out more CO2 than the rest of the Western civilized, Western, uh, civilized countries combined. Period. And so when you look at this video, as we're watching this video, you can understand why. Now, Miss Producer, can you bring up the next global uh, coal plants globally uh, slide? And you'll take a look at that slide. It is amazing. Take a look at all of the coal plants in the U.S. And then and, and, um, there's, uh, I have to take a look, there's 6,000 500 or so, and there's 2,000 some odd in the U.S. So um, thank you, Ms. Producer. Let's go to this other slide. U.S. power uh, generation capacity under development with construction kickoff scheduling between 2024 and 2028. This graph really takes a good look at uh, in the southeast, southwest, and how the Plants are all aligning out in the megawatt usage. I don't have time to go through it now, but it is in the article. Take a look at it, and there is absolutely no way that we can get by without natural gas or coal. Now, if we just got rid of coal, I'm all in on getting rid of coal in an orderly fashion, but I did not know this. And Ms. Producer, in, can you bring up the natural gas plants of the U.S.? And of the natural gas plants in the U.S., I did not know how many were in uh, California. There, uh, there are a significant number of natural gas plants in California. This is huge. Now, there is a coal plant in uh, Nevada, and I'm looking up how much it, California is the largest energy importer in the U.S. They import coal electricity from Nevada. I'm trying to get the numbers of how much they import, but they do use coal as it's imported from Nevada. Pretty interesting information there. So when we take a look at the takeaways of the new EPA uh, regulatory issues going on right now, we take a look at natural gas, coal, and the whole mix. We need a balanced diet of power, and we need, a, we need it all. Wind, solar, I don't care. But you're not going to regulate yourself into net zero cannot be done what's going to happen people are going to uh, have serious failing issues china calls for international investigation in the nord stream attack um china's deputy envoy to the un has called for an international probe into the bombing of the Nord stream uh, gas pipelines 
Uh, this is a very interesting, especially since we had uh, Secretary Blinken meeting with President Z uh, yesterday, uh, two days ago. This is actually very interesting because now China does not mince words. You can even go take a look at what plants they had in the meeting with Blinken. There's a lot of hidden undertones in the backdrop and in the poisonous plants that were on that table. They don't like him. And that was very evident if you take a look and you understand the Chinese methodology of subtle hints in meetings, and it is there. Now, let's take a look at Nord Stream 1 and Nord Stream 2. Those were four pipelines. Three of the four were destroyed, allegedly, by the U.S. with help from Norway. Allegedly. I don't know, but boy, Putin sure said, why would I blow up my own pipeline? I don't know. He, he All he has to do is go flip a switch on the uh, generators, on the turbines on the one end of it, and he could shut it down. So he doesn't really need to uh, turn it off. Now, why are they calling? Why is China calling for this now? This is important because this has been going on since it was blown up, since um, President Biden said there will be no Nord Stream. Uh, and then all of a sudden it happens. Was that uh, unbelievable? Funny story. I just had to just put it out here for you to take a look. Tesla partners with Bayou for full self-driving rollout in China. I'm reading straight from the article here. First uh, bullet point, Tesla's full self-driving, or they call S. FSD system has been approved for use in China. They went ahead and partnered with the aforementioned Chinese tech giant uh, Bayoud for mapping and navigation software to support the full self-driving within China. Um, this approval within China is seen as a major boost for the company, which has been facing multiple challenges due to the worsening EV price war and high interest rates. Um, it's actually caused Tesla shares to jump, tree, uh, jump in the pre-market trading after it was reported in Bloomberg that Beijing, Beijing had went ahead and give that green light to roll out its full self-driving. Um, you know, in a separate report by the Wall Street Journal, um, it, it backtracked a little bit. You know, Beijing has tentatively approved the company's plan to launch full self-driving. This does come, as I'm reading straight from the article here, come one day after Elon Musk unexpectedly visited Beijing on Sunday and met with Premier Lin Kao, um, who was previously the communist chief, uh, Communist Party chief in Shanghai when Tesla was setting up its automobile manufacturing plant. Um, they all go on to say that uh, Musk also met with Robin Zhang, chairman of Tesla Battery Supplier, contemporary Amperex Technology, which is in Beijing. Um, analysts are out in, in, in full force. Web of Security senior analyst told Bloomberg, quote, this is a watershed moment. Um, this could open up full self-driving in China. This is his quote, which I view as unlocking what could be a golden opportunity for them. And again, the, the, they, they read this earlier in the article, but I think it comes down to the inevitable price war. Again, as China does what they do, everything's going to be a race to the bottom on price. So Elon Musk and Tesla is trying to figure out exactly how are they going to compete in China if they're going to be charging a premium price. Well, that means they probably got to have self-driving because if you don't have self-driving and you're charging $80,000 for a car, it's going to be hard to compete with another EV that's got better battery life, longer range for a lot cheaper because it's manufactured in Chinese. It's exactly what, you know, why we buy Chinese products all the time because they are able to offer the lowest price. So I think this... I agree with the analysis here in terms of this is a boon for Tesla, and, and it's clear, and their stock ran a little bit today, mainly off that back. So great for China. Now, you have to remember, there was a lot of security concerns that they had to. I, you know, this is uh, I, we're reading straight from the article. Sources say Tesla will partner with uh, uh, the Bayou to support um, the navigation and mapping. Here we go. Okay, here's the real quote here, folks. Tesla also has multiple data security and privacy requirements that satisfy the country's regulators. That's a one sentence that's very ominous. I'd love to see the source code behind that. Tesla, hey, are they, you know, this day, are they sharing this data with the Chinese communist uh, regime? Who knows? I think that's an interesting question is anytime you're in a Tesla, at least the United States, we know they're recording you in the Tesla. I mean, if you're driving around in a Tesla and don't think they have cameras looking at you in the car 
you're an idiot. Um, but that being said, what do they do with that information in China? Do they have to share that with the Chinese Communist Party? Interesting note there. I love how they just one little sentence in there. Obviously, you know, they're trying to make Tesla look good. Yeah, we, you know, we, they, I'm with you. Tesla's great. But it'll be interesting to see what their, their data privacy stuff is on that. So we will make sure to follow up with that. Kim Rillage, uh, they release a presentation outlining urgent need for board change at Silver Bowl. This is round four, you know, ding, 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 ding. We can get a little, uh, <laughs> um, what you would call it, uh, a little boxing ring going here. Kim Ridge has, has you know, holding about 12.9% of Silver Bow shares, um, has basically fired back round four. Um, you know, really the, the, the biggest, you know, we've talked about this at length. Silver Bow is trying to hold off a corporate takeover by Kim Ridge. They say they're trying to um, basically launch and take over proxy war with the company so that Silver Bow would buy Texas Kimbridge Gas, which is formerly Laredo, at a valuation that they don't think is right. They think that uh, they're over, that uh, Kimbridge is overvaluing KTG and wants to merge with Silver Bow and basically take over Silver Bow so that Silver, they can use Silver Bow's balance sheet to buy Texas Kimbridge Gas, which they believe is overvalued. They walked through four claims here quickly. First, Silver Bow, and this is Kimbridge's rebuttal to what came out two weeks ago. I mean, if you haven't followed this saga, guys, unbelievable. I think we need to do a deal spotlight on this person because there's a lot of crazy stuff going on with this. Here's the first, you know, claims that Kimbridge locks a proxy fight to facilitate a path to change. Um, this is Silver Bow's claims. Kimbridge launched a proxy fight to facilitate a path to change control of the company without paying a premium to Silver Bow shareholders. Cambridge then kind of fires back and says they haven't bought shares in over six, uh, 650 days. They were engaged with them for over two years and asked for a specific thing. Uh, Silver Bowl then says Kimbridge directors that they nominated because remember in this proxy battle Kimbridge is trying to nominate new board members Silver Bowl claims these Kimbridge directors are conflicted with uh, and, and would not look out for shareholders in the best interest um, Kimbridge or Kimbridge fires back and said they're highly qualified independent and then the third quote that uh, Silver Bowl claims is that Silver Bowl strategy has proven to be resilient through market cycles this is where the fireworks Kimbridge fires back and says that quote specifically they go Silver Bowl is generating negative four TS are since CEO Sean Wolverton's tenure and 2.6 annualized TSR over Ellipser and Warriors lengthy tenures. Ooh, hit him where the deep company trades at the lowest valuation multiple out of its peers that on a five-year basis Espo has stock has underperformed the blended commodity group by 58% highlighting the lack of alpha generated from leadership. Ooh, so the rebuttal from Cambridge goes at the three key points that um, round three Silverbow claimed in their, you know, the future of silverbow.com or whatever website they put out. So they're going right at it. Where do I stand on this? We've talked about this much. I think there's, you know, there's there's, there's room in the middle. Is Kimbridge overvaluing Kimbridge Texas Gas? Probably. Much as any company who owns something will do that. I've been part of numerous organizations who you ask what we, you know, internally they much more value their assets than what they do on the street. The reason why they do that is because they still own that. Because if somebody valued them more than you do, you would transact with them. So there's there's a reason for that. So do I think they're trying to force it? Do I also agree the fact that Silverbow has underperformed relative to its position? Absolutely. I mean, that's, you know, common. I mean, everybody knows that. It's something that it's behounded Silverbow for years. Kimmer just trying to step on an opportunity. It's interesting that there's this claim that they, that, you know, six months ago, they couldn't get financing. Silverbow fired back in one of their rounds. Um, that, hey, you had a we had an agreement, but you couldn't find financing. And they were using that to say, oh, well, that's because it was a bad investment. I don't quite know if I know that for sure, but I do think um, it, it's 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 pretty obvious that Silver Bow management has underperformed relative to the market. So it's going to be interesting to see where this deal U.S. producers uh, produces the energy everyone is looking for. This is a 900 megawatt geothermal power plant. This is pretty cool. Um, geothermal, you know, the potential technology, I'm seeing a lot of people talking about. Geopower has almost 27 times expansion by uh, 2050, reaching approximately 100 million megawatts, uh, according to the DOE. Um, GEA, a geothermal energy association uh, in the form of moderate expansion, but anticipates broader scale of 21,000 megawatts of geothermal capacity by 2050. The exciting thing about geothermal is geothermal can take advantage of the EMP 
uh, oil field service and everything else to try to help get that technology so that we can use some of the abandoned wells so we can use uh, take advantage of the ESG and get rid of orphan wells and turn them into uh, geothermal uh, energy. This one, the newest uh, geo is undergoing 900 megawatts in the LA uh, area of the Imperial Valley in California. The only time I'm really, really proud of California, they're doing something like this. This is pretty darn cool. So geothermal, I am a huge fan. And I want to give a shout out to Doug Sandridge today. I'm wearing his shirt that he gave me. I signed the oil and gas executives for nuclear. I am a huge nuclear fan. And uh, we have got to have uh, the low impact uh, environment and long, low cost uh, energy to all consumers uh, let's let's just roll out the nuclear bandwagon. When worlds collide, U.S. Gulf Coast refiners faces challenges to assessing heavier crew. This is a little bit of in the weeds, but since I've got the solo show today, I've got the keys to the kingdom. I wanted to bring this up. Refi we talk a lot on the show about refining margins, and I talk about that relative to when the EIA um, releases all their info. I I I, I tech I, I I like to uh, look at the supply. We bring it up every once in a while in terms of what's going in and out of the refineries from a utilization standpoint. But there also is something to refineries refineries being able to handle a certain type of crude, specifically heavier crude. Obviously you can have an idea. West Texas Intermediate, which is the standard oil price oil composition that, that people base everything off of. We've heard of that. You can imagine that is almost green looking. It's a vial. It's very easily poured in. It's definitely a little bit see-through if you only have a little bit of two. That's that light, sweet crude. What comes up from Mexico, what comes up from Venezuela, what comes from Russia is really a heavy crude, which is almost could be considered more of a paste. Now, heavier crude has a lot of impurities in it, which cause it to trade at a um, discount relative to the light sweet crew, but what it also requires is different retrofitting on the refineries, and because of some of the stuff that's happened in Mexico, specifically over their future forecasted supply of oil, it's it's kind of thrown some of these refineries into into whack here. So I'm going to go ahead and read a few. Uh, a couple paragraphs out of here. The prospect of decreased crude oil supplies from Mexico, the top international supplier um, to the U.S. Gulf Coast, is creating uncertainty among heavy crude-focused refineries. Mexico's state-owned country, Pemex, or Petro um, Pemex, instructed its trading unit, unit to cancel 436,000 barrels a day of crude exports for April and to sign, uh, and to supposedly focus on producing domestic oil at its new... Uh, or processing the domestic oil at its new 340,000 barrel per day dose Bacchus refinery and or existing plants. While this refinery startup is not nearly as imminent as Pemex says, the cancellation of Mexican crude imports could be problematic for U.S. refiners with plants built to run heavy crude, a necessary ingredient to optimize operations and yield. Adding to this complexity of the situation is the upcoming startup of the Trans Mountain Pipeline expansion and recent reinstatement of U.S. sanctions on Venezuelan crude. Um, and this is from, uh, you know, they go on to examine sort of the potential fallout from this decision from Pemex in terms of where those heavy crudes were going. Specifically, the heavy crude is going to be less and less available. So they, it's a really great overview. I'd recommend going to Energy Newsbeat and reading this. Um, uh, Andy, if you can go ahead here and pull up figure one, the typical qualities of Pemex crude oils, you're going to see the different grades there. Olmec, Ismus, Maya, and Altirmio. Notice that Maya is their uh, flagship grade. Basically, um, it's the majority of their um, exports are specifically coming in that Maya flagship blend. The interesting part is that that Maya crude blend does definitely have a little bit of a smaller gravity. You see the API gravity of the Altamira is a little bit lower, sitting at 15 and a half, whereas the Maya is about 20 or 21 to 20. Um, with this restriction in Mexico now sending their a lot of their domestic heavy crude to within um, 
with all of this crude from Mexico now and Pemex staying within Mexico, it goes to wonder where are these U.S. Gulf Coast refineries going to find their heavy crude? We also know Venezuela is is. It, the the sanctions are ramping back up. People have, you know, we 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 drew a little bit of oil. There was a few loads coming out of Venezuela, but now the prospects per se of a lot more oil coming out of Venezuela is not going to happen. So a lot of what these Gulf Coast refineries are dealing with right now, and what this analysis shows, is it tries to plant out where exactly are these going um, to come from, and and the big. The big, big answer, um, specifically in this article, as I mentioned, was that Trans Mountain Pipeline, which flows from Edmonton all the way down to British Columbia and the Puget Sound system, where there are a bunch of refineries. Canada also has a decent amount of heavy crude. So if we have to now shift ourselves and buying it from Canada, those differentials are a little bit different. You pay a little bit more of a premium for the Canadian heavy crude than you would the Mexican heavy crude. So all of a sudden now the spreads on what a refinery can make or not it, it could go down and specifically if you're talking about you know the margin that makes up the refining basis it could get very interesting here i love this breakdown you know via rb rbn energy we do a lot of it that stuff you know it's a 25 billion dollar investment that trans mountain pipeline so whether or not that's going to be able to completely take over or not it's it's going to be interesting. You know, the, this article goes on to say, to the extent at which an individual refinery can lighten up its crude slate by very uh, varies by site, switching to lighter crudes would increase costs, given that light crude is more expensive than heavy crude. However, the light heavy crude differential continues to narrow and may narrow further on the U.S. on the U.S. Gulf Coast, as measured by West Texas Intermediate spread to Houston. You know, these nar- these narrower differentials are expected to incentivize some Gulf Coast refiners to shift towards lighter crude slates. Further, we expect the minimal impact of crude runs and increase in Latin America imports, um, or they they see minimal impact to overall crude runs and some increases to Latin American imports um, to the United States Gulf, excluding Venezuela. So it looks like they're thinking a lot of this is going to come from, from uh, Latin America, Canada, and be able to fill the gap. But very interesting what Mexico um, has decided to do, and it kind of gives you a little bit of behind the scenes on a lot of what these um, refineries are dealing with on the back end. So